Hi, everyone, and welcome to Crypto Beat, the weekly show where we bring you all of the latest news throughout the week in the crypto space. And today we have some breaking news that we'll dive into in a moment, but really happy to see all you guys here. And if you enjoy being kept updated on all the latest crypto news, make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you get notified every time we go live. It's nice to see all the people in the chat hanging out with us today. So we're going to get started. And just a reminder that you will see quiz questions throughout the show so make sure that when you see those pop up at the bottom of the screen type in your answers and we're going to choose a winner who has answered all three questions correctly they will win eternal glory eternal crypto beat glory which is just a glorious glorious thing so let's try and uh, dive into this breaking news to start off with this is just a quick thing that i wanted to mention right at the top of the show because i just the news just broke uh, apparently the us has just linked north korean hackers to the giant axie infinity hack you guys remember that axie infinity's ronin blockchain they suffered a massive exploit last month and apparently the us has just managed to tie that exploit uh tie that hack to north korea's lazarus hackers this was a 625 million dollar crypto theft and that's been tied to North Korea so very interesting news that's just come out of uh, the US Treasury Department uh, just just now so just wanted to mention that off the top of the show and I'm gonna dive into our first article which is about inflation yes we did have latest CPI numbers come out this week and it's not looking good. I'm really sorry to be the bearer of bad news there. So we've hit a new four decade high of 8.5% inflation, which is crazy. If you think about what the Fed stated goal is, which is 2% inflation, which isn't good <laughs> anyway, 2% losing 2% of your the value of your savings every year is not great. Now we're losing 8.5%, but it actually gets worse if you dig into the details of this, which is what we're going to do. So right off the bat, this is the fastest annual pace since December of 1981. This is up from 7.9%, which was the uh, recorded rate in February. And so now we're at 8.5 for March. And uh, this is, it marks six straight months of inflation above 6%. As I said, this is well above the Fed's uh, stated target of 2%. The question is being asked, what is causing all of this? And I've seen some interesting things on Twitter. Some people are saying like, oh, this is clearly Russia and, and this is Putin and this is the war and this is why oil prices are coming up and that's skewing the whole CPI and a lot of talk about the invasion of Ukraine. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I'm gonna take a lot of issue with this. Let's pull up that uh, tweet that basically shows uh, when the invasion happened and what was going on with uh, inflation rates up until then. It's a nice little graph there. See that red area? See how it just goes straight up there? Like inflation just goes straight up? It's at the very end of that uh, that marks the invasion of the Ukraine. So all of this nonsense about, well, this is all caused by Ukraine. Let's blame Russia on all of this. America loves blaming Russia on everything. Uh, no, it is the trillions and trillions of dollars that the fed has been printing that has been leading to all of this let's not mince words here let's not you know throw russia under the bus uh for this let's throw russia under the bus for all the other awful things that they're doing at the moment but the inflation is definitely a result of experimental and crazy monetary policy by the u.s federal reserve that has gotten out of hand they have printed way too much money to service a huge amount of u.s debt and u.s spending and uh it's just gotten out of hand and now we're seeing 8.5% inflation. Now let's dive into these inflation numbers a little bit more. Uh, so air travel prices were 23.6% higher than they were a year earlier. Auto prices, uh, which have powered much of the inflationary surge, they actually eased slightly in March, but despite the monthly decline in used vehicle prices, these numbers are still up 35.3% from a year earlier. 35.3%, it's insane. Just put that in terms to make sure that people understand what this means. If you bought a, a used car a year ago, it was going to be 35.3% cheaper than it is now. You are spending a huge amount of money on the same goods because your money is worth a whole lot less now. Meat prices were up 14.8% in March from a year ago. Uh, breakfast cereal prices closed, uh, it climbed 9.2% in the last year. All of these things 
are just hurting so many people because these are everyday things that people can't go without buying. You can't go without buying food. Uh, and so it's just really, really hurting a lot of people here. Air prices can probably be attributed a lot to oil prices going up so much. I mean, if you think of how expensive it is to fill up a car, filling up an airplane is a lot more expensive. Uh, but there are obviously a lot of other things going into that. Now, there, I, I read a great article uh, by Avic Roy he uh, released a, an article on Substack and he talked about how inflation is actually far worse than you think. And I just wanted to dive into what the, he mentioned because I thought they were interesting points. So he said, you know, March's official inflation rate is 8.5%, uh, but we need to understand the impact on lower and middle income Americans of this inflation. He said that if you're wealthy, you're far more likely to be a beneficiary of inflation than a victim of it. Home prices have appreciated 20% in the last year, which means that if you owned an expensive home, then your net worth went up far more than your daily expenditures did. Because I've had this debate with a lot of people where they were talking about the stimulus checks and how, how it's great that we're printing this money and handing it out. And I'm like, guys, no, printing money, this is actually going to hurt those people the most. It's going to hurt the poorest people because it's going to lead to inflation and inflation is going to hurt the poorest people because they have a whole bunch of inelastic goods uh, that they have to purchase. Inelastic meaning that, you know, the the, the demand for this doesn't change according to the, the uh, price of it. The demand for food is going to stay the same, right? They're going to consume the same amount of food and the same amount on their rent and all of this stuff. So there are lots of inelastic goods that the lower and middle uh, income people have to cover. And if all of these are going up in price, it just is tremendously hurtful, right? And uh, it, it's, yeah, it's just, a, it's it's really sad to see all of this. How, um, also, there's an issue with official measures of inflation. So Avic pointed out that these are geared towards describing the consumption patterns of average Americans. So if you think about what the CPI is, it's kind of like this basket of all these goods that people kind of estimate that people need to buy in their day-to-day -day lives. And how much has that overall basket gone up or down in terms of uh, how much you can get for the value of your money? And uh, so he begs the question, like, what happens if you're not average? Like, what do they even define as an average person when they're figuring out this basket of goods? And, and it's pretty difficult to figure out. And actually, we're using metrics that were created in the 80s. So like 40 years ago, we we're determining like what the average person purchased then and kind of building these metrics based upon it. Like it gets, it gets really complicated. And a lot of people dismiss the CPI completely and just say, I mean, it's all just a bunch of crocked up, you know, rubbish. Um, so he bring, uh, brings up the point that lower income Americans spend a greater share of their earnings on everyday necessities necessities relative to higher income Americans. And this means that lower and middle income Americans are harmed more by inflation than the wealthy. He also brings up the point that for all of last year, politicians kept saying, well, this is transitory. Inflation is transitory. And everyone who knows anything about economics was looking at the absurd amount of money being printed. And they're just saying like, this this is not transitory. You know, unless you're going to shrink that supply real quick, this is not transitory. And so Arvik agrees and said, you know, these price increases have permanently destroyed the purchasing power of the US dollar. This isn't something that's just going to go back down. This purchasing power has disappeared and inflation is likely to stay high for a while. So he says that about a third of the CPU, CPI's uh, market basket is based on surveys related to home prices. And while home prices appreciated 20% in the last year, the government's official measure of housing inflation is up only 5%. So in other words, if the government used a more accurate measure of housing inflation, the CPI would actually be 13.5% and not 8.5%. There's also the argument that people bring up about how, well, we actually changed how we determine inflation back in the 80s. We switched some things around. And according to those 80s figures, if we calculated it the same way, we'd be well into double digit inflation. So there is a lot of theories about what the actual inflation is, but safe to say that our purchasing power has gone way down. People are struggling and it's a lot more difficult for people to make ends meet right now because of this experimental money, monetary policy from the Federal Reserve. Now, Avic brings up the great point that rising federal debt is an underappreciated driver of inflation and one that is only going to get worse 
with time. And it's just super important to remember, you know, the more the government promises to spend, the more they have to figure out how to pay for that and the more money they're going to print. The more money they print, the less all of our savings are worth. It is the hidden tax that affects the poor and middle class disproportionately. And it is really horrendous. And we really should be, you know, pushing back against this. So I wanted to mention that right off the top of the show. I think it's huge uh, news. Oh, I, I see a lot of responses to the crypto quiz in the chat. Well done, guys. Uh, excited to read through those. Um, but I wanted to talk about now the Fed's secret repo loans. This is an interesting article that uh, was was broken by a couple of researchers and then it was covered again in Bitcoin.com's news. Interesting stuff here. Let me see if I can uh, do it justice and explain the situation. Basically, the Federal Reserve has been pumping what is what they say is a cumulative $3.84 trillion in secret repo loans into US trading unit of the giant French global bank BNP Paribas in the first quarter of 2020. What does all that mean? It sounds like a whole bunch of gobbledygook. So essentially the New York Fed uh, this week just put out a data dump of their repo loan data to explain what a repo loan uh, is. It's basically a repurchase agreement. It's like a short term loan uh, where, you know, uh, dealers and government securities, they can sell these securities and then buy them back for a, a more expensive rate. It's generally an, on an overnight basis, although it can be extended. And we'll talk about some of the extensions that have happened in this latest data dump. Um, so basically, it, with a repo, the dealer sells government securities to investors, um, usually at this overnight basis, then buys them back the following day at a slightly higher price. So the mechanics that are going on is that they're essentially um, you know, getting money and then uh, being given, lending out money and then being given back a little bit more money um, than they actually gave. So that's the interest rate that for that overnight loan that has been determined. Now, why is all of this interesting? Well, I mean, it's kind of considered this kind of a loan is, is like a proxy for a risk free rate. So it's a very cheap loan that the Federal Reserve uh, gives out. And, uh, and I, I'll dive in at the end what these loans are actually meant to be for. But basically in this latest data dump, uh, they have withheld the release of the names of the bank that got these loans, but under the provisions of the Dodd-Frank financial reform legislation of 2010, they actually have to reveal some of this data. So some of this just uh, came out and there's been like a two year lag for the release of this information. And no mainstream media has really reported on that. I was questioning why that is. Like, is this a scandalous thing? Is there a media blackout? Or is this just a, a normal thing that happens and these loans happen all the time and it's not really something to pay attention to? So here's what I think about this whole situation. Um, the details of this include uh, the French bank that I mentioned, but also six global banks uh, that from the US also received 63% of the total of these loans. And these are you know, cheap loans from the Fed. And uh, I'll talk about cumulative versus non-cumulative in a moment. But basically, the reason why this may seem scandalous is because it, it can be considered to be like this bailout from the Fed. Um, now, let me just, uh, so the journalists I mentioned, so Pam and Russ Martins from the Wall Street on Parade, they reported about this and kind of dove into the data. Now, the central bank says that these loans are meant to support overnight lending liquidity. These reporters say that the data tells a very different story. For example, you've got banks like Deutsche Bank, um, which they they say was literally on the verge of total failure at the time. Like they're basically insinuating that these loans were more of a bailout than just adding liquidity in a liquidity crisis. So the whole point of these bailouts, um, they're supposed to, be just whenever there's a liquidity crisis. And so this latest data suggests that maybe the Fed might be doing something illegal. Maybe they're actually giving bailouts to banks uh, that when there's no liquidity crisis, it's just banks who are trading in really risky derivative trading, getting a bit of a, a, a booster there. And the, the question is, is that even legal? So as I mentioned, these bailouts were supposed to be stopped by the Dodd-Frank Act. Then US Treasury Se Secretary Janet Yellen apparently helped change that. And she said, you know, how do you even define a general liquidity crisis? Um, they did an interview with an economist who said, 
you know, what they mean by a liquidity crisis, what, what we mean are kind of different things. And so it's kind of interesting to see like what's, what's going on here. Dodd-Frank was meant to say, you know, let's not let the banks have their trading facilities and gambling facilities on derivatives. Um, we're not help, supposed to help the banks out if they're trading in all these risky things and then they get themselves into trouble. This isn't a bailout mechanism, but it seems that it might have become one. Now, there are a couple of strange things going on with this report. The journalists have let, let me try and let me try and explain this here. When when you have one of these overnight loans, like let's say you loan someone a billion dollars, it's meant to be overnight. Now, if you extend that to like a fourteen uh, day period, do you count that as a billion or do you count that as fourteen times a billion? So it becomes fourteen billion, right? So what they've done is done the cumulative total, which is an astronomical amount, but it's not really how these loans are generally calculated so the report may be exaggerating those but the question is still there about whether this is actually the role of the federal reserve at all another thing i'll point out is that these loans are 100 percent collateralized in fact they're over 100 percent collateralized they're sort of considered risk-free which is why they're super cheap loans there is a question of did the fed even lose any money on these loans which i think is a legitimate thing to ask but then the other side of things is again big question of why is the fed lending out this money what's going on with these banks that they need these liquidity uh injections um are they doing risky trades and taxpayers are on the hook like big questions that need to be asked and i think that the reporters raise a really good point when they're asking them and just saying like we need clarity we need more transparency with what the fed is doing why are all of these banks getting these injections of capital is there really a liquidity crisis or are they just dealing in risky things and taxpayers are on the hook and we need to be addressing that so i wanted to mention this article just because i thought it was uh it was pretty interesting to kind of dial under the hood of the types of things that the federal reserve does which includes apparently giving trillions of dollars to banks and loans but let's move on to the next topic because this is a really important topic that i wanted to bring up we've talked about this a lot on the show about Virgil Griffith. Now he is an Ethereum developer and a few years ago he was arrested because he went to a conference in North Korea and he talked about cryptocurrency at this conference. He was then arrested because he was charged with violating international sanctions for this crypto talk that he gave. So US prosecutors accused Griffith of teaching North Koreans how to evade sanctions, a violation of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act or the IEEPA. So he was arrested. We've been wondering for a while what's going to happen there. They just sentenced him. He will get five month, uh, five years in prison and he will pay a $100,000 fine for helping North Koreans use cryptocurrencies to evade sanctions. There's so much I want to dive into with this story. Uh, first of all, any information that he gave at that conference is all freely available on the internet. Blockchains are open, permissionless system. No one needs any help in order to be able to access them. They're accessible to everyone. And, you know, I do YouTube tutorials all the time that people could use to evade sanctions if they wanted to. That is not the implicit desire of my channel. Uh, that is not why I create these videos, but all that information is out there. And now Virgil Griffiths got five years in prison for teaching people about cryptocurrency because he taught the wrong people. I think there's a big question here about whether that is right. And, uh, and we really need to be asking that question. So the, uh, during this, this case, they said that, you know, a great personal sacrifice to himself, Griffith tra traveled to North Korea to share educational materials about blockchain technology and return to persecution. Um, a lot of people spoke out on behalf of him leading up to this. A lot of very prominent people, Vitalik Buterin also spoke out, uh, you know, advocating on Griffith's behalf, just saying what a good person he is, why there should be leniency in this sentencing. Uh, he said that he had been friends with, um, with Griffith for seven years. He was a former Ethereum Foundation employee, and he said that Griffith's nature left a lasting legacy on the Ethereum Foundation and the wider community, as well as Buterin himself. Buderin also said that uh, Griffith's attitudes and actions of the years helped to foster an open-mindedness and an orientation towards cooperation that guide my actions to this day in a way that was absent from my personality five years ago. So it's a pretty strong uh, advocacy um, letter from Buderin there. 
He also told uh, the judge about Griffith's long-standing curiosity with other cultures, which led him to move to Singapore in 2016 and work to make Ethereum compatible with Islamic finance law. He said that he really wanted to go to uh, North Korea just to see what it was like, a sort of fascination thing. Um, now, the prosecution then said, what you see here is intentionality and a desire to educate people on how to evade sanctions. And that's what this sentencing came down to. The judge was pretty dismissive of the claims that you know Griffith had no intention of doing these things. He basically sided with the prosecution and said, no, there's clear intentionality there. Um, and also the, the judge and the prosecution also referenced the ongoing war in the Ukraine, as well as the US government's use of sanctions against Russia to justify the need for a harsher sentence in order to deter Griffiths and similarly situated others from future violations of US sanctions law. So what it seems here is you have this very political case being held up. He's being held up as an example and being used as an example to deter others. So he's not really being treated fairly in terms of what he actually did, which was, you know, relay information that's already <laughs> freely available on the internet to anyone who wants to look for it. And uh, he's given five years in jail because it was the wrong audience who saw this information. It's also important to realize that the North Korean regime loves crypto. At the top of the show, we already talked about how you had this North Korean hacker gang that was responsible for one of the biggest crypto heists in history. They've been involved with crypto for a long time and, and Virgil Griffith didn't, didn't start that. They've been involved with this long before Griffith went to North Korea. So the idea that Griffith was instrumental in helping North Koreans in this way, and it's because of him that they're able to figure out this crypto world is absurd. Um, they have already become a malevolent force in the global crypto scene before Griffith. Um, so it's like, it's a, it's a big question here. I, I definitely don't agree that someone should be behind bars for educating others. I think that's crazy. I think sanctions on education is just a crazy thing. Uh, we did get a super chat. I just want to read that out while we uh, while we've got that there. Uh, a huge, huge thank you. Uh, let me scroll down here. Mohammed Mala, uh, who sent a oh a hug sticker there. I really appreciate you and uh, thank you so much for for your support there, Mohammed. Um, but this whole case, I mean, it really begs the question of when you have freely flowing information because someone happens to be the wrong audience for that information. Does that mean that? you deserve to go to prison like can we sanction speech and education and apparently the u.s government thinks that they can they really don't want north korea being given any help as they consider it virgil just considered himself as a speaker at a crypto conference um so it's just I, it's a really tragic situation because virgil is a huge uh, net benefit to the crypto community. He is a developer who's contributed a whole amount and is so sad to lose someone behind bars uh, just because he wanted to educate people about this permissionless currency that can help anyone. And let's face the facts, it can help anyone. He, he didn't say anything incorrect. People want to evade sanctions. They can definitely use cryptocurrency to do it. it turns out that they don't use cryptocurrency to do it because it's easily trackable and you've got to use centralized exchanges, which can be controlled. So so this has not been proven to be a tool that's popular for evading sanctions, but it is possible to use it for evading sanctions. And that's just the reality of this. But if some person happens to watch your video or watch your speech, uh, who was not meant to hear that information, you can now go to jail. So it's a really sad situation. Uh, he's now in Brooklyn Metropolitan Detention Center, where he's been for the last several years leading up to this trial. That re the absolutely disgusting conditions he's been in, it, ex it included extended solitary quarantines due to COVID-19 outbreaks, no family visits, limited access to blankets and warm clothing, even being forced to use his sink as a toilet. Uh, meals, like one or two meals a day would be like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I mean, the whole thing is, is horrendous and it's so sad to see this. And I asked Twitter what they thought about this. I said, this week, ETH developer uh, Virgil Griffiths was sentenced to five years in prison for teaching people about cryptocurrency. Education should not be a crime, agree or disagree. Uh, a lot of people in my third team to ag agree is a <laughs> slightly biased audience, uh, self-selective. They tend to watch the channel because they believe in financial freedom. Uh, but 87% did say education is not a crime. 12% said that education is dangerous. Education is dangerous. 
interesting that 12, uh, 12%, almost 13% of people feel that way. I would love to know if you were someone who voted that education is dangerous. I would love to know, um, you know your reasoning behind that. I want to understand that perspective more. It's not my perspective, but I definitely want to try and understand that point of view. Um, because I think that everyone has the right to edu education. Uh, Eric Voorhees had a great tweet response where he said, uh, five years in prison for teaching people about cryptocurrency. Think about that. And uh, it really is. I mean, five years for teaching people about cryptocurrency. We teach people about cryptocurrency here every single day. And this this guy who's just such a, an important contributor in the space got five years in prison. Uh, really, really sad situation. So my heart goes out to him and his family there. Uh, we did have quiz questions throughout this show and I wanna go over the answers because it's important that everyone knows about this stuff. Uh, if you're from North Korea, please tune out now because I don't wanna be giving you any information that could help you as citizens become more free and get away from your tyrannical government because that would be so terrible according to the United States. First question, what does a Bitcoin ATM do? It is indeed a way to swap cash for Bitcoin or Bitcoin for cash. And uh, they're pretty common these days. So we've got a tutorial out if you guys want to learn how to use a Bitcoin ATM, you can check that out. Be aware this is not a means for anonymous crypto trading. These machines are KYC and it's up to the person who's running the ATM to determine what kind of KYC they implement. And uh, they can be fined if they don't report suspicious activity, et cetera. So there's, there's risk involved and they generally don't wanna have liability for that. So they're gonna be collecting phone numbers, taking pictures of the cameras. Just be aware of that if you're using these ATMs. Uh, what does KYC stand for? It is of course, Kentucky Yak Chicken. No, it's not. Uh, it is know your customer. And uh, this includes all of the things like when you hand over your ID to exchanges, it's a way for the government to make sure they know how money is moving between people. The great thing about cryptocurrency, if you're setting up peer to peer is you don't need any of that. And it is secured by math and not secured by all of the security teams who need access to your IDs and everything. So that's why, why crypto is so much better for privacy. And what is Bitcoin mining? It is indeed the process of being able of being issued new Bitcoins uh, or cryptocurrencies for being the first to guess a really long number. That's essentially what it is. You've got to be the first to guess this really really long string of digits and if you do you get a reward or if you get part of it you get a reward if you're part of a pool pretty interesting stuff there and i appreciate everyone who participated and we have a winner so i want to invite my producer on to announce who that winner is and i'm going to introduce it with a drum roll very nice always an honor to come on and to share our winner of Eternal Crypto Be Glory. Today's winner is a YouTube viewer, DB Woodcraft. DB Woodcraft. DB Woodcraft. Congratulations. You have achieved Eternal Crypto Be Glory. I want to give a shout out to our other producer in the show, Will Sandoval, who's behind the scenes. Actually, you guys are chatting a lot with him out there, and he keeps track of all of this and chats with you and gets me all your answers and your super chats. So, Will, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. DB Woodcraft, congratulations. Hey, I've, Naomi, I've got some fun facts. Is, oh, are they completely legitimate facts and definitely not made up? Absolutely. DB Woodcraft Fantastic. loves, he loves, you ready for this? Quality handcrafted wood products. Mm. He loves having a hoot at the zoo. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he loves getting his information from reliable resources like NBTV. I added that like part. Like NBTV, but. you added that part. Well, it's well, still a legitimate it's... fact. And there's awesome facts from DB Woodcraft. So thank you for tuning in. And Sam, you got to have a wonderful rest of your day. You did a great job today. Thank you. You as well. So everyone, thank you for tuning in. Please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you found any of this information interesting and if it has helped you in your crypto journey. We are here to serve you guys. If you have any questions about crypto, if you have things you want answered, if you have stories you want covered, make sure that you hit us up in the chat, in the comments, on our Twitter, on all of the places where we are on social media. And uh, we'll try to get those questions answered for you. We want you guys to have all the information you need because education is not a 
crime and it is important and it is empowering and we want all of you to live empowered lives as individuals so go have a wonderful rest of your week and the rest of your weekend if you celebrate easter go and enjoy that if you don't go and celebrate all the things that you usually do on the weekend and we'll catch you next week we will be at the same time we've been this week it will be 10 a.m eastern daylight time so make sure you tune in for that on both thursday and friday next week go have a wonderful time love all of you catch you later